Okay, <clears throat> this is a replacement for the CV diagnostics that expired on conference in Canvas. So if you've already listened to the conference that was on Canvas, you do not have to listen to this one. But if you had not, this is your opportunity to go through the diagnostics chapter. Just a review of what you need to do prior to the test that will be coming up in October on the chapters that we are currently studying. You can review the cardiology objectives on your own. Okay guys, we're in chapter 32. We are on page 691. And as far as uh, considerations as we age, well, the single greatest risk factor for cardiovascular disease is our age. And it is the leading cause of death in adults over the age of 85. And this is a result of the fact that we've aged. We've had many different disease processes, been exposed to environmental factors for a long time, and have developed and stayed with a lifetime of not necessarily good behaviors. On page 691, there is table 32-1, just going over some of the things that happen as we age, such as increased collagen and decreased elastin which just leads to a um, decrease in cardiac reserve, which means we old people do not respond as easily to changes in blood pressure and heart rate, stress, and can lead to heart failure. The heart valves become thick and stiff. This can lead to the onset of new murmurs, whether they're uh, any concern or not has to be investigated. Uh, it could mean that there's no cardiovascular disease, but we do have to follow up. Decreased number of pacemaker cells means that they're more likely to suffer from irregular cardiac rhythms and have a more varied heart rate. And a decreased number and function of the beta adrenergic receptors leads to a higher systolic blood pressure. And remember, that's mainly the hypertension that they suffer from is a higher systolic blood pressure or systolic hypertension. Um, we've been over most of these age-related changes, and we've talked about the fact that they're more prone to orthostatic hypotension. This is especially true if they have to go on antihypertensive medication, and that they're more likely to experience a drop in their blood pressure post-eating. Okay, we're on page 692 now, talking about taking down subjective information regarding, regarding the cardiovascular assessments. And so you guys can kind of read through this, but obviously like for past health history, you would want to talk to them about any issues with chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, alcohol, tobacco abuse, etc. Medications, anything that they're using, uh, any hypertensive, antihypertensive medicines, um, any over-the-counter drugs, issues with clotting, aspirin, any of those. Um, as far as the functional health patterns, you can read through the questions that are on page 693. These are questions that help you to do a focused cardiac assessment. Okay, as far as collecting objective data for a cardiovascular assessment, then you can flip the page, and you can see that we're starting on page 694. You guys obviously know how to assess vital signs, but if you're unclear about the parameters for orthostatic hypotension, you can read through that. We do um, three things. We inspect, we palpate, and we auscultate when we're doing a cardiovascular assessment. Obviously, inspection, we're inspecting the skin for the color, the hair distribution. For instance, remember we talked about PAD and how they will have lack of hair on their lower extremities, uh, that their skin will look thinner and taunt. You want to look um, for any edema, any rubber, um, especially dependent rubber, which would be suggestive of PAD. Clubbing of the fingernails, and uh, you guys can read through this. As far as palpation, um, you guys know that we can palpate uh, all extremities for temp, moisture, pulses, and edema. Uh, you can look for edema. You guys know how to assess for edema and know that it's from 1 plus to 4 plus. You know that you can palpate your pulses and that you can also gauge those from being 0, which is absent, to three plus, which is bounding. You guys understand why we do cap refill? Um, this just gives us a su suggestion of arterial uh, blood flow. And then the last is auscultation. And um, just looking for turbulent blood flow when we're doing auscultation with the cardiac system. 
you can uh, know that a brewy is um, indicative of turbulent blood flow, and it's like a humming that you can hear. Um, for instance, like if you placed it over the carotid and you heard an abnormal sound. Okay, this is just a picture reminding you guys of the names of the different um, pulses that you can palpate. This is uh, just another picture on page 695 reminding you guys of the proper placement of your stethoscope for the different areas that you would auscultate for heart sounds. Okay, just a couple of things on this slide. Uh, heaves. Heaves are actually a sustained lift of the chest wall uh, around the heart area, and they can be seen or sometimes even palpated and could mean that the patient has an enlarged left ventricle. Uh, the PMI is nothing more than the apical pulse. And so sometimes when someone's laying supine, they're flat, you can't actually see, it's like indicative of where the apex of the heart is. You can actually see the PMI, but you certainly should be able to hear the PMI. All right, so next we're gonna talk about cardiac uh, markers. These are on page 698 and 699. Um, these are what we talked about in class. They're called cardiac enzymes. I said that we would just uh, learn about two of them, the creatinine kinase and the troponin. And so once you're looking um, on page 699, it talks about the creatinine kinase, and it tells you that we specifically need to look at the CKMB because that's um, specific to myocardial bands. And so this particular enzyme is released when there is actual uh, myocardial tissue damage. And uh, this particular um, cardiac markers, remember, are done in a serial nature. And so what that means is that they'll get them upon admission. And um, they get them upon admission, and then they're going to get two more sets, and they're going to be eight hours apart. Okay? And the CK will, uh, MB will start to rise in three to six hours peak in 12 to 24 and go back to baseline within 12 to 48. The troponin has two different ones. There's the troponin T and the troponin I. We're not gonna learn specifics about those. Uh, the troponin T and the troponin I, just they're done right along with the CKMB. They uh, start to elevate four to six hours after the onset of uh, myocardial tissue damage peak in 10 to 24, but actually stay detectable in the blood for up to 10 to 14 days. And so this is a better marker because of the fact that it lasts so much longer. You do not have to know the norms for these, but I do want you to understand the timing of when these have their uh, onset peak and when how long they stay in the blood. This is just a picture that's kind of showing you the difference of the troponin, you can see how much longer it stays in the system versus the CK, and then uh, as in class I said, we would not learn about the myoglobin.